The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Good morning, everybody. I am thrilled to be here, and I want to congratulate all the honorees, our distinguished leaders in education, and our principals, and our teachers, and all my wonderful old friends. I want to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, none other than Chancellor Matthew Goldstein, who's a luminary in his own right, mathematician, and the head of all of the CUNY uh, colleges and community colleges. So I pass the baton to Chancellor Goldstein. Uh, for me, it's an honor to acknowledge um, a group uh, like you this morning. Uh, you are truly uh, partners uh, with uh, all of the people that we have at the City University of New York. And I'd like to throw out some challenges uh, shortly as I go through some of my prepared remarks. Uh, with the much uh, appreciated opportunity I have today to talk to educators, I'd like to address a key issue question that concerns all of us. How can we graduate more students without diluting the experience that these students have as they traverse through our educational systems? And how can we ensure that these students are, to the degree that we can assure anything, uh, prepared for a very challenging and very different environment of work? Uh, in the coming years. It's just one question, but I think it's a deeply complex one. I think we can start to answer it by understanding an even more fundamental question about who are our students. Thanks to uh, Jay Hershenson, you already know about CUNY's students. For one thing, there are a lot of them. We serve about 270,000 degree-seeking students and an additional 230,000 adult and continuing education students. Uh, this um, weekend, I had the opportunity to address a group of financiers out in a very tony area of uh, the East End and when they were asking me questions about the City University of New York, they were just knocked over by the enormity of uh, this system. Not only do we have all of these students, but they come from about 210 different countries. Close to half are the first in their families to attend college, and nearly three quarters come from uh, New York City public schools. But among those facts is another story. It's a story that I have been recently calling the tale of two tales. CUNY is now enrolling more high achieving students than we have in our history. That's a tale at one end of a preparedness spectrum. We're also enrolling a growing number of unprepared students the uh, other tale of this distribution. For example, the number of applicants to our Macaulay Honors College, and I'm pleased to say that the very distinguished dean of our Macaulay Honors College, Ann Kirshner, is here with us this morning. Thank you, Ann, for being here. Just that particular small college, the number of applicants has increased by 36% just this year alone. And SAT scores of those admitted to this uh, small college it exceeds 1,400. I only use those two, uh, those two uh, scores because I still can't add up eight, eight, and eight to get to 2,400. But those of you who are old enough to know that 1,600 is still the area that we consider. At the same time, more than three quarters of the students who come to our community colleges from New York City public schools need some remediation in order to be ready for college level work. So as enrollment has grown, so has student variance. This tale of two tales is a story probably unique to CUNY. 
We are a single system that encompasses graduate and professional schools, baccalaureate co colleges, and community colleges. And we are an integrated system. All of our colleges and schools are located within a confined geographical area. We have frequent student transfers, cross-campus collaborations, and consortial degree programs. So the student variance we experience affects the entire system. Now, when you have large variance, large variance is manageable at an organization, whether it is an educational organization or any other kind of sector, but you need two basic things. You need a lot of money. The larger the variance, the more money you need. And you need an enlightened management structure in order to address those particular challenges. We don't have the first, but we are certainly working on the second to ensure that the students that come from all sectors of society and from the two ends of the educational spectrum, and of course the major mass in the middle, has the kind of educational experience that we think is essential for these young people to uh, proceed with their careers. But other large public university systems operate quite differently than CUNY. In California, for example, there are three separate systems. The University of California, that is the only sector authorized by the state of California to grant the PhD and other professional degrees. California State University, that is authorized to give only bachelor's and master's degrees. And the California Community College System for associate's degree. The CUNY system offers all of these degrees. And that means our tens of thousands of students don't line up on the same starting line. Nonetheless, while they may start from different places, our goal is to help each of them finish. We want to ensure that each student is prepared for the next step and for a lifetime of learning. Let me be very clear. When I started at CUNY, the very basic principle that I was dealing with is it doesn't matter necessarily where you start, but it sure matters where you end. And that to me has been a guiding principle in everything that we've done. And that requires relentless innovation. There's no quick fix, no shortcut. CUNY has some of the most creative and committed educators in our country working to develop targeted ways to challenge and support each student and maximize their ability to succeed independent of where they started this very arduous race. For many students, the decision to pursue a degree is interwoven with a complex set of personal circumstances, be it financial need, childcare, job schedules, transportation, and much more. Even students who are academically ready for advanced study may need help in navigating a pathway to degree completion. Take, for example, a LaGuardia Community College student named Lillian Zepeda, who is here with us this morning. Lillian was a wife and mother at age 14. She realized that she needed a college education to open up more opportunities for advancement. And LaGuardia offered that opportunity with experienced faculty and counselors and flexible scheduling options. Lillian took a full course load for two years while caring for her two young children. Faculty and staff recognized her communication talents, her work ethic, and her stellar grades, and she earned an internship in the college's office of marketing and communications. The college then nominated her for a community college transfer opportunity scholarship program. 
And today, with a $20,000 scholarship in hand, Lillian will attend NYU this fall to study media, culture, and communication. She herself put it best. LaGuardia is really interested in making its students into scholars, helping them become students who will succeed at a four-year college. So I am confident of Lillian's success, and I'm delighted that she is with us this morning, and I wondered if you could join me in congratulating her and her mentor, Carlin Cow, Professor of English and Director of the LaGuardia Honors Program. So congratulations. <laughs> Community colleges continue to be a focal point at CUNY and across the country. They enroll almost half of all undergraduates nationwide. And I threw out a statistic that very few people believe when I did but it's true, and you can check it out as well, that in 2008, do you believe that half the PhDs that were conferred in the United States by American universities were to students who started at a community college? It's a pretty remarkable statistic. So it shows you that the world has changed in a very, very dramatic way. But unfortunately, uh, our community colleges have been mired for a long time in maximizing uh, opportunities for students to graduate. Three-year graduation rates for urban community colleges is only 16%. We simply have to do better at that. And Lillian's story demonstrates earning an associate degree is clearly beneficial to students. It advances intellectual engagement, and it offers better educational and employment opportunities. So our charge is to identify the roadblocks on the way to a degree and to determine the best interventions to address them. That thinking led to our ASA, ASAP initiative, an acronym for Accelerated Study in Associate Programs. I had the idea uh, with a burst of light, 2.30 uh, in the morning, several years ago, where my wife was saying to me, what are you doing? And I was walking the apartment and thought about community college graduation rates and knowing virtually nothing about community colleges, came up with an idea, which is when some of the great ideas come from people that are totally misinformed. And I was totally misinformed. But I came back, shared the idea with people at, um, at CUNY who knew a lot more about the subject than I did, went to see our mayor, convinced him that the idea had some merit. I left with a $20 million check, a promissory note. I think I paid for breakfast, but I got the uh, promissory note. And uh, the rest uh, has been an extraordinary um, uh, journey. So let me tell you a little about this, this program. ASAP is designed to reduce the uncertainty that slows so many students' progress and to create clear pathways to a degree. It requires full-time study in the first year in small classes and builds in comprehensive advisement and counseling. It offers tuition waivers for eligible students and gives students the uh, access to textbooks and a monthly metro card. The results of the program have been uh, quite, quite frankly amazing. The 2,500 participants in ASAP to date have a combined three-year graduation rate of 56%. By way of comparison, a similar group of CUNY students has a 23% three-year graduation rate. So when I'm presented with data, I'm a tough guy when it comes to looking at data. I really was skeptical. So I insisted that we hire MDRC, which is by far the nation's leading research organization on matters of this kind of study. And they confirmed what it called ASAP's very promising findings. 
In 10 years of studying community college programs, they have said they have never seen such large effects. And so we're on to something really special here. Most important, the impact on students has been rather extraordinary. Let me tell you about Lukman Lamani, one of our outstanding ASAP students. He originally came to the United States from Togo, West Africa. He spent five years in this country working in retail and other jobs with little satisfaction. He joined the ASA program, ASAP program at Bronx Community College in the fall of 2009. And he graduated last spring, just two years later, with a GPA of 3.77 and a transcript full of service and study abroad activities. He's now studying accounting and political science at Baruch College and expects to graduate next year. Lukman is with us this morning, along with his ASAP assistant director, Daniela Boykin. So please acknowledge this extraordinary. <laughs> what a difference the right program can make, and that's why CUNY is expanding ASAP in order to serve 4,000 students by 2014. And my expectation is, with the money that we are starting to raise from private sources, that I hope in the future that we will be able to expand this experience to about 20% of all our community college students. Like Lillian and Lukman, most students know a great opportunity when they see one. That's also been true of our Macaulay Honors College, which, as I mentioned, is experiencing a record number of applicants. We created the college in 2001 because we knew that there were so many high-achieving students across the city who wanted a challenging, eye-opening college experience right here in the city, one that wouldn't break the bank. So we made the college tuition free, we raised a lot of private money, and we offered students a laptop and a New York City cultural passport that gives them access to museums and cultural uh, uh, venues at a little or no cost. I was the one that came up with the idea of a cultural passport because I borrowed it from an alumnus who said to me when I was president of Baruch many years ago that New York City was our campus. All of the cultural institutions really enhanced the experience of learning. And I said if we were able to get that principle embedded into this program and get these organizations to, to support the students were onto something and it has been an extraordinary ride so far. We incorporated courses about the city into the curriculum along with research assistantships, study abroad options, internship opportunities, and a community service requirement. And we've also encouraged them to customize a course of study consistent with their ambitions. The results have been truly exceptional. Lots of Rhodes Scholars, numerous Truman, Goldwater, Fulbright, and National Foundation Scholars. This year alone, CUNY had 16 National Science Foundation Scholars, $126,000 for four years, the most that we have had by a factor of four in our history. And we're very proud of that. Keep in mind that three quarters of Macaulay students are city residents, three quarters are graduates of city schools, and 60% are immigrants or children of immigrants. They are students like Julian Flores, who graduated from Macaulay Honors at CCNY just this past month with a degree in biology. At Macaulay, he assisted in research of autism spectrum disorders, he counseled parents in a family health intervention program, and he participated in a summer mentorship program at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He won numerous academic awards, including the best poster in neuroscience at two national conferences and a CUNY Jonas E. Salk scholarship. After this fall, he's going north 
to Harvard Medical School to pursue his degree in becoming a pediatrician. I'm delighted that Julian is here this morning, accompanied by Ann Kirshner, who is like a mother, saying, my young son is going to Harvard. What could be better? So let's give him a... The reason that not too many of the financiers that I was discussing this weekend with is that all of them went to Harvard, so they didn't know as much about CUNY as they know today. So that was, and I was not out raising money, I was out discussing some policy stuff with them. You can see why CUNY's mandate to create innovative, effective programs matters so much to all of us. All of the programs I've mentioned are carefully designed to help students expand their learning capacity and advance their skill level and academic progress. And indeed, across the university, we continue to see increases in student graduation, but there is yet much work to be done. The tale of two tales highlights a number of important issues. One, CUNY and all universities have to work with all of you in this room. There is no one-size-fits-all program. To reach students, we have to target specific challenges with thoughtful interventions, so our work with the DOE must continue to be a priority. Success in college, we all know, depends on early planning and rigorous K through 12 preparation. With the new Genome Center, with the new uh, Technion Cornell, uh, uh, success, and I think Mayor Bloomberg needs great, great applause for that innovative kind of thinking. We're going to need to reimagine what we do in K through 12 education to prepare those young people for those jobs that many of us in this room have no idea are, uh, what, what those jobs are going to look like, and we have to be ready to prepare students to address that. And that is a challenge that I'm going to have to address to you and to the uh, faculty at CUNY as well. So I'm going to end there by saying that I am uh, delighted to be a partner with all of you. I appreciate the work that you do. I understand the complexity of the work that you do. The tale of two tales is going to be with us for a very long time, and it's going to be a challenge to be able to get our arms around this very, very large group of students so that we give everybody the opportunity they need. We don't care where you're starting, but we must insist that all of us work hard to ensure that these stu students get the degree that they need. So thank you for your indulgence this morning. And for the so I have um, another, why don't you hold that for sure. me, Paula, thank you. I have another um, pleasure this morning uh, because I'm going to introduce one of our honorees and it would give me a pleasure to introduce all four of these honorees because I'm a big fan of all of them. So, but uh, in particular, I'm going to introduce Jay Hershenson, who is, he has a title. Do you remember Delaney cards, any of you? <laughs> you do, Edith. You would need a very big Delaney card to uh, put Jay's uh, functions. He's Senior Vice Chancellor for University Relations and Government Relations all sorts of relations, good relations, <laughs> and secretary to the board of the City University of New York. I've worked with Jay side by side for nearly uh, 30 years. Um, I've known him uh, since he was a very, very little boy, and he's grown up to be quite an accomplished uh, gentleman and a, an exceptional, exceptional uh, member of the CUNY community. I don't know anybody that works harder than Jay Hershenson. This is not blowing smoke. This is true because I literally get emails from Jay while I'm sitting three inches away from him <laughs> in a car going to Albany. I mean, I can't believe that I'm having a conversation with him and he emails me on an idea that he has. I also get him early in the morning 
really early. I don't get him until I finish my workout in the gym, but he's sending it at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Much of our success at the university is the very hard work of our faculties and administrators who come up with ideas about you, you, uh, moving the university forward. But somebody has to communicate what it is that we're doing so people truly understand it. And Jay, among his many roles, is really the chief communication officer of the City University of New York. Jay doesn't simply work for CUNY, he is CUNY. He is an alumnus of two of our institutions, Queensborough Community College and Queens College, and has been immersed in CUNY matters even as a student. In fact, he was the very first elected student trustee on the university's board of trustees. Since then, his enthusiasm for serving the university has never waned. He has led universities' outreach efforts for almost, are you ready, 30 years. He started in 1984. I can't imagine having the same job for 30 years, uh, but he has basically uh, been overseeing government, media, community relations, marketing communications, CUNY TV, and the administration of the CUNY Board of Trustees. As anyone will tell you, Jay is indefatigable. He is always cheerful. Uh, when some of us get a little gloomy, Jay always has light that he sees rather than darkness. A dear friend, wonderful wife, and Becky. Becky, why don't you raise your hand so everybody can see you. Uh, and a dear friend of mine, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Hershenson. That was quite a generous introduction. I wish my mother and father could have been here today. My mother would have loved it, but my father wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> it, is, it is true that I have been working at CUNY since 1847, but that's because I started in the Early College Now program. I just want to remind everyone here that getting older is a function of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor Goldstein. And I say this not just from the heart, but because I have met just about all of the chancellors in higher education around the United States, and he is the number one chancellor in all of higher education in the United States of America. And we owe him a great debt of gratitude. He could stand up here for days describing CUNY programs that he's initiated, but I believe that his greatest gift to our city and state is the constantly increasing number of CUNY's high quality graduates at all levels representing our future leaders and workforce. Please give him another round of applause. Thank you, Paula Rosen, for everything you do to communicate the importance of education news about the people who make the school systems work and who face the challenges to make it even better. Your vision is an inspiration to everyone here. I want to congratulate my fellow honorees, Senior Vice President Charlotte Frank, who I first met at the Board of Education when she was executive director of the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. I remember me, that's right. Charlotte goes back a long way improving education in the city of New York for many, many years. President Tomas Morales, who I first met at City College when he was vice president for student affairs of the entire student body. That's right. And he's such a wonderful, wonderful leader. And President Jennifer Rabb, who I first met at a Schraff's coffee shop. But that's another story. And it was around the corner from her major law firm. And of course, we know the extraordinary leadership that she's providing in Hunter College. You've all accomplished educational miracles and are exceptionally deserving of today's honors. And finally, let me thank my wife and partner, Rebecca Seawright, 
who has been so wonderful to me and to our entire family, who's here with our dear friend, Helene Goldfarb, surrounded by wonderful CUNY students. And as the chancellor indicated, and he says this time and again, at the end of the day, that is who all of us are here for, the students. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Paula Rosen, for the invitation to uh, introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Jennifer Rabb. Uh, but uh, let me just take a moment to also say how wonderful it is to be in this room of New York City educators. Uh, here we are early on a Monday morning, committed to doing the important work uh, that we do. And I just uh, tip of the hat to all of you for the contributions that you make uh, to our city. Uh, it's a particular treat for me to be asked to, uh, to introduce Jennifer. First, it gives me an opportunity to say a public thank you for a very uh, gracious, uh, generous act that she performed exactly eight years ago, uh, right after I'd been named president at John Jay. Uh, the first call I got from a fellow president was from Jennifer, who called me uh, to say, the best thing about what you're about to do is that you will be associated with an important public mission. She also said, CUNY is like lots of other government bureaucracies, and you'll just figure it out, Jeremy. Year after year, Hunter has gotten better. Now, how do we know it's gotten better? There are many ways that we measure such things, but one is it's become more and more selective over the years. As Jennifer told me in one of our early breakfasts, she said, Jeremy, one of the things that you'll look forward to as John Jay follows this lead is there'll be phone calls that'll come to you from people saying, could you please help my son or daughter get into your institution? So Hunter is now one of the most selective uh, colleges uh, in the city, and not surprisingly has been, been rated nationally year after year as one of the top 10 schools in the country for the best value in public education. And that's a tribute to leadership. That's a tribute to President Rabb. Beyond the undergraduate programs at Hunter, Jennifer's accomplishments extend to other parts of the Hunter empire. So through sheer persistence and personal dedication, and it's a great story if you ever want to hear it, Jennifer is herself responsible for opening the, reopening the landmark Roosevelt House on East 65th Street, restoring it to public use, and creating a, a very important forum, the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, a forum for discussion of the pressing policy issues of the day. If that weren't enough, under the leadership of Chancellor Goldstein, she has been at the head of a team within CUNY that created the School of Public Health which was accredited in record time and reflects an innovative and timely approach to the health challenges facing our country. She has also put her uh, formidable real estate experience to use to negotiate a land swap and a public-private partnership that moved the Hunter School of Social Work from East 79th Street to a beautiful new home in East Harlem, thereby underscoring and reaffirming CUNY's commitment uh, to that neighborhood and to the communities of the city. So not surprisingly, Jennifer is known among her CUNY colleagues as someone with a very clear vision of excellence and the tenacity to make that vision a reality. Although Jennifer has earned uh, three Ivy League degrees, has a wonderful pedigree as a, uh, as a litigator in New York City, she has one diploma on her wall in her office, her diploma from Hunter High School, the school she attended as a young girl from Washington Heights who dreamed of a life of meaning for herself. By hanging only this diploma on her wall, Jennifer reflects her gratitude to the city and to CUNY for her education, but more importantly, her commitment to providing similar opportunities for other ambitious young people growing up in the city today. I'm pleased to welcome to the podium, Jennifer Rapp. What an honor to be with this group of awardees. It's like a family reunion. Charlotte Frank, a wonderful Hunter alum, a member of our Hall of Fame, and famous for her cafeteria voice. My dear friend, Tom, Tomas Morales, who I am so much going to miss as he goes off to California. And of course, Jay Hershenson. Well, he is not only our rock, but our rock star. There's Madonna, Prince, Cher, and Jay. Only one name is necessary. Say Jay and everyone knows who you mean. Presiding over all of us is the inspiring, our inspiring leader, Chancellor Matthew Goldstein. We could never achieve what we do at Hunter without his incredibly strong support although I'm sure he's happy to see me with my hand out for an award this morning rather than to ask him for money. Chancellor Goldstein created the CUNY Renaissance through brilliance, persistence, and vision. I am so grateful to be part of his team. 
to success in making CUNY an institution that offers a world-class education at an affordable cost could not have come at a more critical juncture. At a time when college is a ticket to the middle class, private schools have simply begun to price themselves out of the reach of working and middle class families, and the recession has made this crisis even worse. Parents are now looking at private college tuitions approaching $45,000 a year. Now how can the average working family afford that for two children? That's $45,000 times four years times two kids. You do the math. Under Chancellor Goldstein's leadership, CUNY students don't have to choose between skipping college or being plunged into debt. We at Hunter are so, offer, so proud to offer a priceless education at a price students can actually afford. While I am very moved by this recognition for my contribution to the turnaround at CUNY, I want to salute all the phenomenal public school teachers and principals here today because we stand on your shoulders. It is the hard work that you do every day that allows us to succeed at the college level. It is a privilege for me to be here with all the outstanding educators in this room who are rightly being recognized for your achievements. As the proud product of New York City Public Schools, I personally stand on the shoulders of a great generation of educators who came before you. When I look out at you, I remember the dedicated teachers at PS 173 in Washington Heights who cared for me and nurtured me. In addition to being great teachers, they were there for me when I lost my dad in second grade, just as they were there for me every step of the way. And I can never thank them enough. As Jeremy said, I went on to Hunter College High School, a part of the CUNY system, which then, as now, was one of the top gifted schools in the country. Then, as now, it was filled with immigrant students and kids whose families had not gone to college. I was one of those kids. But my teachers and guidance counselors made sure I broke that pattern. The faculty was focused on creating a pathway up to college for all of us. My mother didn't know we should visit colleges and wouldn't have had the resources to do it even if she did. But my 11th grade social studies teacher drove us in her own car at her own expense to visit colleges. She did not rest until I was accepted with one of the nation's top colleges with a full scholarship. I am also a proud public school parent. My daughter went all the way through from PS24 in Riverdale to Anderson Middle to Bronx Science and was taught and guided by extraordinary professionals. Yet when I would recommend the local public schools to my neighbors, I was shocked by their lack of enthusiasm, including a response by one mom who said, but my child is quite smart, as if being smart meant finding an alternative to the public schools. That is a perception that we have to fight. The word must get out that public does not mean second best. That's why I am so proud. That's why I am so proud to be with so many award-winning teachers. And since so many of you have been honored for teaching excellence, I would bet that many of you went to Hunter College. So how many Hunter alums do I have here? Okay. Uh, how many of you have paid your alumni dues? Okay. Um, Hunter is proud of our education school graduates because we are at our roots a teacher training institution. Thomas Hunter founded Hunter College in 1870 because he believed that eighth grade girls should not leave the classroom in June, only to return in September at the front of the class as teachers. He was quite ahead of his time in insisting that these young women could gain, should gain two years of content knowledge, a year of pedagogical, pedagogical training, and a clinical experience like a doctor, which is why we started Hunter Model School, now Hunter Elementary. From the very start, our teachers entered the classrooms armed with both knowledge and skill. This was a progressive idea for the 19th century. Today, we continue Thomas Hunter's mission of preparing and supporting teachers, not tearing them down, which is too often the case in today's society and certainly in our local media. Today, we continue to invest in our nationally recognized school of education with new programs and innovations like our groundbreaking video analysis program. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce our former state education commissioner and current dean of Hunter School of Education, David Steiner. And we are committed to not only training great new teachers, but to supporting those of you who give your hearts and souls every day in the classroom. We are particularly proud of the success of our new high school, the Manhattan Hunter Science High School. Launched in 2003 in partnership with the Department of Education, it has now become one of the most successful early college high schools in the country. 
As the largest senior college in the CUNY system, we were painfully aware that too many high school students were graduating unprepared for the rigors of a college education. We designed an experiment on, a, on, the belief, on our belief in the impact of great teachers and leaders, who are even on students who are behind. We purposely recruited students with average or below average grades in middle schools. Most of them are from families close to or below the poverty line. But we looked beyond test scores for potential. We looked for students with good attend attendance, committed family members, and drive. We recruited a great principal and helped her find superb teachers. Working with our college faculty, we designed a curriculum focused on making sure students could do college level work. And then, for the seniors who were strong enough, and this year that was 90% of the class, we moved the last year of high school to our college campus. These seniors take their last high school classes and two college classes each semester at Hunter. They leave knowing what it takes to be a successful college student and with as many as 12 college credits under their belts, tuition free, putting them ahead as they enter college. On Friday, we graduated our fifth Manhattan Hunter Science High School class. 90% of the students graduated in four years as compared with the city's average of 65%. And almost 100% of those students, 103 out of 105, were accepted to college. And we are particularly proud that 26 of those students will come to Hunter College, all on full scholarships underwritten by a Hunter board member. These students, remember, were students who four years ago were facing many obstacles, including poverty and poor grades. Manhattan Hunter Science High School does what public education can do at its best, especially when higher education collaborates and supports the secondary education system. So how perfect that one of the teachers being honored here this morning is from Manhattan Hunter Science High School, social studies teacher Heather Hanneman, who is, of course, a Hunter graduate. Congratulations to Heather, our talented principal Susan Kreisman, and all our wonderful Manhattan Hunter Science teachers. This is such well-deserved recognition. I only wish there were more events like this to honor our phenomenal teachers and principals. I accept this award today in the name of all of my friends here from Manhattan Hunter Science High and all the extraordinary public school teachers and principals who too often toil without sufficient recognition. Who better represents the great Hunter motto, Mihi Kura Fratori, the care of the future is mine, than the teachers in this room. Today, and we know because of the work that you do, the future is strong. With deep appreciation and gratitude, I dedicate this award to you and pledge to work with all of you, with my CUNY colleagues and Paula and her staff to celebrate public education and to work to make it flourish. Thank you for this wonderful award. Charlotte Frank. <laughs> wow, I guess is the one word it would be the one word introduction. Um, you all know the main strokes of Charlotte's remarkable career, sort of busting through glass ceilings everywhere. She was the only girl in her high school physics class at James Monroe High School in the Bronx. This girl was accepted in the School of Engineering at City College of New York, then known accurately as the Harvard on the Hudson. In college, this girl majored in statistics, minored in economics. So she decides to teach, was hired to teach math at Intermediate School 131 in the South Bronx. She knows intuitively that for math to have any real meaning, to make sense, it had to be real. So she gets some seasoned, knowledgeable guys to come talk to her sixth graders about stocks and bonds. The kids learn a basic rule. Don't buy what you don't know. So they pool their resources, and they buy one share of Huffy bicycles. And so for the entire year, these kids are tracking the stock market fluctuations of Huffy bicycles, noting the changes in price, percentages, learning math, without realizing they're learning math. At the end of the year, each child earned 40 cents when when this girl showed, sold the shares. So she was a pioneer in what we now call project-based learning, relevant curriculum. And many years later, when this girl was working for McGraw-Hill, 
A man came up to her and said, you, you probably don't remember me, but you were my sixth grade math teacher. Uh, my parents couldn't believe that I was interested in stocks. My mother used to say to me, what are you doing? We're poor. This was a project kid. Um, well, that man became a, a dance placement teacher, assistant principal, and no doubt a successful investor as well. So fast forward. Fast forward to Charlotte in the classroom, in the Bronx. Her principal calls her into the classroom and she calls her into his office and shows her this new machine. He says, this is a computer. It's made by Olivetti. Can you understand it? Well, the instructions were in Italian, which of course was one of Charlotte's languages. So she was able to translate that. And the principal said, could you teach the men how to run this thing? So she did. Well, this, this came to the attention of Olivetti. And Olivetti hired her, um, shattering yet another glass ceiling. So from then on, her rise was meteoric. She was rehired by the school as math coordinator, curriculum coordinator, before long head of curriculum instruction for the district and the entire city. Along the way, she's earned master's degree, uh, PhD. She's always given back, whether as a regent, which she was, or a trustee, which she's been, or just as a good friend. In 1988, she joined McGraw-Hill and continued to shatter glass ceiling. She's now senior vice president. She's received close to 100 awards for her contributions to American education. And I suspect she's just getting started. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlotte Frank, Dr. Charlotte Frank. I should say I have asked her to speak to us this morning in English. As Jennifer Robb said, I never lost my cafeteria voice. One, I must say, it is an honor to be here with Matthew Goldstein, because he doesn't realize that when I graduated from, and when I decided not to be an engineer and to get my BBA in as John said, that was true. That was true. Uh, majoring in statistics and minoring in economics, I went to downtown city. Matthew made downtown city Baruch College. He made it wonderful. I mean, he's made everything wonderful. Other things, there are other ties here. When I got my master's, when I decided to become a teacher because I decided, well, originally my mother said to me, Mom, don't listen to me. Mom, uh, I want to go, when I decide not to be an engineer, I, I'm going to the, I'm gonna go into the School of Education at City. No, Mom, no, Charlotte, you don't go there, because they're all old maids. <laughs> they don't even use that term anymore, but the last thing I wanted to do was that. So that's when I went, ended up going to downtown city. But the other part is, I went for my master's, and I graduated from Uptown Hunter, which is now Lehman College. So I have this whole history network. I mean, you've got Lehman College there, you've got Hunter here. I mean, this is family. I had this wonderful job at the Board of Ed, that time it was the Board of Ed, and I had an official car that took me around the city. Did my own driving, but it was an official car so I could park anywhere. I come back to the office in, in Brooklyn, in Livingston Street, and what they do is they put their messages, the telephone messages on my desk, and one of them is from McGraw-Hill. Oh, I said, oh God, we guess we didn't pay some bill. So, my McGraw-Hill colleagues are laughing. I, uh, I call, the first thing I hear is, Joe Dion, who is then the president and CEO of McGraw-Hill says, May call Charlotte Frank and see if she wants to change her career. So I conflict and change. Well, this is a company that I decided to join that that is now 120 years old. So you can see some people are shaking their heads. Yes, yes, 120 years old. The president, CEO, and chairman, Harold McGraw III is the fourth generation. Uh, I, I, so, because we're going to talk about change. 
you will be reading about how change is going to happen in McGraw Hill, but because it's a, it's going to be publicly divided. And I, I can't talk much more other than to say that this company will still say, stay together. We no longer have to have warehouses. We no longer really have to have books with covers. We no longer have, the one thing we are is we are information providers. It's the information that we provide. And we now have five high school programs, math and science, five of them physics on iPads. Apple iPad is the one that launched it. We've got things in cinch science, we've got them all over. And my McGraw-Hill folks will tell you all about it. But this is, remember, we are an information providing company and we will continue to provide information, whether it's S&P, Standing & Poor's, Aviation, and God could not be everywhere. So she gave us educational update and Paula Rosen, and it is an honor, an absolute honor to be with you here today. I want to call upon Dr. Christine Sia, who's a regent of the New York State Board of Regents, and who I've known for must be at least 35 years, and she is going to be presenting the award to President Tomas Morales. Dr. Morales has served as president of the College of Staten Island, that's a senior college in the CUNY system, for the past five years. In August, he leaves New York to take on a new role as president of California State at San Bernardino, as the chancellor mentioned before. When Dr. Morales assumed his presidency at CSI, he brought to the campus a renewed sense of energy, a commitment to enhance the student's college experience, and a promise to strengthen ties between the college and the Staten Island community. You would only have to speak, spend a few minutes speaking to, to President Morales to recognize his passion about the power of education to transform lives. And today, under his leadership, CSI is thriving and will continue to grow into the foreseeable future with the vision he has set into place. Dr. Morales leaves behind a college that is highly committed to educational excellence and an enhanced campus experience for all students. President Morales' mantra, it's all about the students, <laughs> is reflected in the fact that full-time enrollment at the College of Staten Island continues to grow, and more students are seeking baccalaureate degrees than ever before. In his continued quest for excellence, Dr. Morales created a scholarship program to attract valedictorians and salutatorians from high schools in our area. And these numbers have also grown, as has participation in the Macaulay's Honor College. And over the last five years, four new honor societies were inaugurated. The student population has grown in diversity, and I am told that the college has one of the best support programs for students with disabilities in the entire CUNY system. In all, the student college experience has grown to include a robust undergraduate research program, participation at professional conferences, and expanded opportunities for community service and study abroad. At the same time, the campus itself is growing. Under a new strategic plan, the college is currently constructing its first ever residence halls on the campus, a building that will house an interdisciplinary high-performance computational center is in the design phase. And a new transit hub is being investigated to ensure greater access to the campus for faculty and students. And truly, the list of accomplishments goes on and on. As Dr. Morales takes his leave in August, he can do so knowing that he has accomplished what he set out to do. Make the College of Staten Island a center for excellence in scholarship and civic mindedness. He can be proud in knowing that under his leadership, the college recently passed the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Accreditation Evaluation with commendation in 12 of the 14 categories. This is quite an accomplishment. President Morales, 
Thank you for your leadership and your passion and your vision that you brought to the college and to the Staten Island community. You can rest assured, although I'm sure you'll never rest, <laughs> that you leave the college and the community in a better place than when you arrived. We thank you and we wish you every success in your new leadership role. I present Dr. Morales. My good friend, Matthew Goldstein, has led the City University of New York's widely lauded transformation since 1999. I have to agree with my, my, my close colleague, Jay, when he describes Matthew as really the top chancellor of public higher education in the United States. We're very fortunate to have Matthew leading this university. But he's also someone who is extraordinarily student-centered. For him, it's about student success. For him, it's about graduating students and indeed transforming lives. It's been a privilege for me to serve on his team. I will be forever indebted to him for providing me with the opportunity to lead the College of Staten Island. It's also been a privilege for me to, to work with a group of truly dedicated and outstanding presidents. The collegiality and the camaraderie among the presidents is very, very strong, and that's a tribute to, to the leadership of Matthew Goldstein, an incredibly talented chancellery and indeed dedicated board of trustees. Dr. Christine Sia has worked tirelessly on behalf of the College of Staten Island and our students as our foundation board president. She leads a group of civic and business leaders who have increased philanthropic support by 79% over the last five years. And not only are they out helping us raise dollars to support scholarships, but also under her leadership has engaged these business and civic leaders with our students in our mentoring program with the board foundation and other initiatives. And she insists that we have our board meetings in different places around the campus. And that's really worked uh, marvelously. Thank you, Christine. I also um, just say to you that all of these accomplishments that Christine has outlined, our success in our middle states evaluation, uh, visit our uh, recent uh, publication of our strategic plan, Many Voices, One Vision, the increased number of students who are going to the most prestigious medical schools and law schools, PhD programs, our valedictorian will be beginning, will, a Mexican-American immigrant who will be uh, beginning his PhD studies at Harvard, the prestigious uh, history program at Harvard. Um, all of these accomplishments are done by the faculty and staff at the College of Staten Island. And the faculty uh, provide the kind of mentoring and research opportunities that's really um, unique throughout the country for undergraduate students. My fellow honorees, my good friend Jay Hutchinson, whom I have had the pleasure of working with for many years, indeed, he is an iconic figure in CUNY. Jennifer Rabb, who has had a transformational presidency at Hunter College, and is just a wonderful friend. Charlotte Frank, extraordinary educator and leader, your belief that a better education makes a better future is why we are all here today. I am truly grateful to join such a group of leaders in education, and I'm privileged and humbled to share this honor with you. I also want to recognize all of the teachers and principals that are being honored today. You're doing the hard work. You're in the trenches. Um, you're changing lives. You're transforming lives. And as a product of the New York City public school system and a graduate of James Monroe, uh, I am a Monrovian, uh, I really know the work that you're doing as teachers and principals in our schools. Education update for organizing this wonderful celebration of effective leadership, and for keeping New York City educators informed through their award-winning newspaper and comprehensive website. 
Thank you all for the opportunity to share this morning with you. Thank you.